congratulations. You've made it more than halfway through the class. In week five, we're going to learn more about the trait approaches to personality. Before we get started with Cattell's theory, I wanted to touch on the nature versus nurture issue with the trait approaches. Virtually every dimension of personality that we've studied over the years has some way been tied back to nature, DNA. The evidence for the relationship between personality and nature is strongest for several dimensions, including extroversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism. The research suggests that inheritance makes up as much as half of the variance in personality. The results of twin studies and adoption studies suggest that as much as 50% of our personality is determined by our DNA. This suggests that the genetic factor in some cases may outweigh the social factors, the environmental factors. Although we recognize the importance of nature, we also pay special attention to the environment, family, friends, teachers, coaches. The social environment also plays a role. Let's begin with Raymond Cattell. Raymond Cattell was born in England to parents with extremely high standards, and he had to compete with his siblings for his parents' approval and attention. He ended up studying physics and chemistry at the University of London and graduated at age 19. He went on to work with the famous psychologist Charles Spearman, who is known as the developer of factor analysis. Cattell would use factor analysis in his own research. He earned his PhD from King's College in London in 1929 and found success when he moved to the United States. He ended up working with Gordon Alport and William Sheldon at Harvard University. He worked with Edward Thorndike at Columbia University. He also worked at the University of Illinois where he published over 500 articles. That's very impressive. Later in his life, he taught at the University of Hawaii before retirement. Cattell's goal was to predict behavior. He wanted to be able to predict what a person would do, how they would respond to specific stimuli. He defined personality in an unconventional way. He basically said that personality is that thing, whatever that thing is, it's that thing that permits us to make a prediction about how someone will behave. He described behavior as orderly, lawful, following a set of principles. If we can understand those principles, we can predict behavior. If behavior is not consistent across situations, Cattell said it would be very difficult to measure personality. But because personality is stable, we should be able to measure it and then predict it. Unlike the previous theorists, Cattell studied personality from a more scientific perspective. He was not interested in changing or modifying behavior from abnormal to normal. He was not interested in treating mental illness or abnormalities. He was interested in predicting behavior. He relied on his observations of behavior and collected a ton of information from all kinds of people. He submitted this data to a statistical procedure that we call factor analysis, Spearman's factor analysis, in order to determine how different variables are related. This table is from Cattell's article. It's a list of his personality test items. After he gave these items to test takers, he would analyze the results using factor analysis. When you analyze a test using factor analysis, the results show you the different factors that might be present. For instance, look at number 219 and 240, the two items boxed in red. 
those two items are correlated. They're asking about something similar. Whatever that thing is that they're asking about, it's similar. Those two items load on to factor A, whatever factor A is. We don't have a name for it yet. We just know that these two items, 219 and 240, are highly correlated and are probably measuring the same thing. Look at the bottom of the table. We have another factor, factor E. Again, we don't yet know what the name is, but we know that item 159 and item 273 are measuring something similar. So they are said to load onto a factor. These three factors, A, E, C, he called traits. Each one was a trait. Patel defined a trait as our tendency to respond in a certain way. He believed that traits were the basic unit of personality. He identified 16 source traits, 16 basic units of the personality. Based on these 16 factors, these 16 traits, he then created his famous 16 personality factor questionnaire, which is a questionnaire that we still use today. Test takers can score high, low, or somewhere in between on any one of these factors. Take extroversion, for instance. On one end is high extroversion, on the other end is low extroversion, sometimes labeled introversion. Cattell proposed many different types of traits, as you can see here. Source traits are the single, stable, permanent parts of our behaviors, of our personality. Common traits are those qualities that we share. Unique traits are those traits that are very specific to individuals. Ability traits refer to those skills and abilities that allow us to use our other traits in everyday situations. Temperament traits are related to our emotions, our moods. Dynamic traits are related to our motives and our drives. They change from situation to situation. That's why they're called dynamic traits. Constitutional traits are the behaviors that are related to biological factors. For instance, if you're not a morning person, you might be crabby in the morning. Environmental traits are those behaviors that are impacted by our family, friends, social environment. Cattell identified 16 traits, and you can see them here in this table. You have the label on the left, the factor letter, and the title. So factor A was known as the warmth dimension. You have in the middle column, the characteristics that a low scorer might exhibit. In the right hand column, you have the characteristics that a high scorer might exhibit. Cattell proposed six stages of personality development. The first stage begins at birth and the last stage ends at death. In the first six years of our lives, we're in the infancy stage. Cattell said this is the time of our lives where we're learning how to be more independent, trying new things, meeting new people, learning how to feed ourselves, learning how to get dressed. We're learning how to do all of those things for ourselves. Between the ages of six and 14, we are in the childhood stage. This is the time in our lives where we begin to separate from our parents and identify more with our peers, with our social groups. From the ages of 14 to 23, Cattell said we were in the adolescence stage. This is the time in our life when we are experiencing all kinds of different conflicts. We're trying to figure out who we are, but the world is telling us who to be. Then in the maturity stage from ages 23 to 50, we learn how to balance all of the different roles in our lives, how to balance our work with our family, with our personal lives. This is also said to be the most productive time in our lives. Then between the ages of 50 and 65, Cattell said we were in the late maturity stage. This is the time when our personality changes 
in response to the changes in our physical environment as well as our social environment because it is at this stage that many people are slowing down at work or even retiring those changes then change our personality once we reach the age of 65 Cattell said we transition into the old age stage we begin to adjust to the loss of friends family members our work maybe even some of our hobbies in this stage in the old age stage we may experience loneliness and insecurity if we don't take the right steps one of the things you'll notice about Cattell's stages of personality development is he proposed a drastic personality change in older adulthood, somewhere between the ages of 50 and 65. Some of the early personality theories highlighted the importance of both nature and nurture. We know that. Cattell investigated this relationship between both nature and personality and nurture and personality. He studied twins, identical twins and fraternal twins in different rearing situations. The influence of nature was evident because identical twins who share nearly 100% of their DNA were more similar across personality dimensions Based on his twin study results, he concluded that a third of our personality is influenced by genetic factors, while two thirds was influenced by social factors. To collect data, Cattell used three different methods, L data, Q data, T data. L data stood for life records. Life records are records of your daily behaviors in everyday situations like work or school. Q data stands for questionnaire data. Now Cattell's questionnaires were a bit different than the typical questionnaire. He asked test takers to rate their own behaviors. Early on Cattell warned of the potential faking and inaccuracies of personality testing. T data stands for personality tests. These tests are different from the questionnaires because these personality tests, according to Cattell, are attempting to measure personality without individuals knowing that their personality is being measured. To analyze data, Cattell relied on multivariate approaches like factor analysis. Bivariate approaches to data analysis look at two variables and the relationship between these two variables. Multivariate approaches look at two or more. They look at multiple variables, studying the relationship between them. Cattell's R technique refers to collecting large amounts of data from a large number of people. He might test handfuls of individuals and study their test results. The P technique involves gathering a large amount of data from a single individual, one person, but collecting that information over a long period of time. Cattell's P technique is an early version of the longitudinal study that we're so familiar with today. These correlations then between the different tests, the different types of data that he would collect, these correlations then informed his personality model and led him to choose 16 different personality traits, 16 personality factors that each of us exhibit to varying degrees. The 16 PF is still used today. It's used in research clinical diagnosis, and also in training and development to predict occupational success. It's been translated into 40 different languages. That's important because it gives you some indication of how popular this test is. Today, we have different versions for different purposes and for different age groups. 
if you'd like to take an adapted version of Cattell's original 16 PF questionnaire, you can visit this website. Modern researchers have put Cattell's ideas about the 16 personality traits to the test. We know that the 16 PF questionnaire can predict marital stability. We can assess both partners and make a prediction about how well they will get along based on their test results. The test can be faked just like any other personality test. Cattell warned against this and modern research absolutely 100% agrees that we have to be careful when using personality tests for this reason. We also know that the test can be used in many cultures, but there are language limitations in some parts of the world. There aren't always words, literal translations for some of the original words on his questionnaire. Modern research also supports his notion of constitutional traits and environmental traits. There are source traits that are more determined by genes than others, something Cattell called a constitutional trait. There are also source traits that are more influenced by environmental factors than DNA. He called these traits environmental traits. So we do have some support for those two different types of source traits. We also have support for the 16 different factors now let's look at the theory of Hans Eisenach. Eisenach was born in Berlin, but immigrated to England in 1934 when the Nazi regime began to take power. He studied psychology at the University of London, but only after he was unable to get into the physics program. He initially was more excited about physics, but his grades were not good enough, so he was stuck with psychology, which turns out to be a great thing for our field. Eisenach was one of the most productive psychologists in the history of the field. He spent most of his time working at a hospital in the psychiatry department, conducting research on personality traits and their connection to psychological health. Throughout his lifetime, he published nearly 80 books and more than 1,000 articles. In 1997, at the time of his death, he was the most cited psychologist of all time. He worked with his wife to create different personality tests, the Eisenach Personality Profile, the Maudsley Medical Questionnaire, and the Maudsley Personality Inventory. Like Cattell, Eisenach also believed that nature played a major role in personality development, and Eisenach also conducted studies with identical twins and fraternal twins. The assumption is if identical twins share a characteristic more so than fraternal twins or non-twin siblings, the assumption is DNA is playing a role. Eisenach found that identical twins' personalities were more similar than fraternal twins' personalities, and he also found that adopted children's personalities are more similar to their biological parents' personalities than their adopted parents' personalities. Cattell believed a third of our personality could be determined by DNA. Eisenach thought that percentage was much larger. Another similarity between Eisenach and Cattell is their emphasis on traits. They both believed that factor analysis could be used to identify different personality traits, but Eisenach was more critical of factor analysis than Cattell. He recognized that factor analysis was just one way of analyzing data. He also used other statistical procedures and relied on personality tests and even experiments to identify personality factors. Despite the similarities between the two, Eisenach was a critic of Cattell's work, mainly because he had a difficult time replicating Cattell's studies. Eisenach identified three dimensions of personality traits. Each one of these dimensions he called a superfactor. 
a combination of behaviors that we use across situations and across time. These super factors, these three dimensions, he said were stable across the lifespan. The three dimensions are extroversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism, ENP. Eisenach's first dimension is the extroversion versus introversion dimension. He defined extroverts as those who are oriented toward the external world. They prefer the company of other people. They tend to be sensation-seeking, adventuresome, carefree, but they also tend to be dominant, impulsive, and assertive. Because extroverts have a lower base level of cortical arousal, it takes more stimulation to get a response from them. This is very different from introverts. Those who tend to orient toward the internal world who shy away from external excitement. They react strongly to any type of stimulation. Because they have a higher base level of cortical arousal, it doesn't take much to, to stimulate an introvert, to get them excited, to get a response from them. The second dimension is the neuroticism versus emotional stability dimension. Eisenick said that highly neurotic personalities have a number of common characteristics. They tend to be anxious, tense, moody. They tend to have low self-esteem and are prone to feeling guilty about their behaviors. He also said that there is greater activity in the part of their brain that controls the sympathetic nervous system. This part of the body then reacts to even the most mild form of stimulation. The body then is in a constant form of hypersensitivity, constantly reacting to, to mild stressors in the environment. Eisenach's third dimension is the psychoticism versus impulse control dimension. He said that highly psychotic individuals shared several characteristics. They tend to be aggressive, egocentric, impersonal, impulsive, tough-minded, and insensitive to the needs of others. They tend to score low on tests of emotional well-being, and they are at a greater risk for drug and alcohol abuse, as well as violent criminal behavior. Based on his research, he found that highly psychotic individuals also tend to be raised by authoritative, controlling parents, as opposed to those who love their children unconditionally and allow them to express themselves freely. You can take an adapted version of Isonex personality inventory using the Excel questionnaire that I've created. You can find it on Blackboard. Cattell and Isonex's work provided the foundation for the next two individuals to create their big five model of personality. Paul Costa Jr. earned his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1970. His focus was on human development. Throughout his life, his research has emphasized the relationship between age and both personality and cognition. Robert McRae earned his PhD from Boston University in 1976. He focused on personality psychology in graduate school and has spent his entire career promoting the trait approaches of personality development. His research is mostly focused on the structure of personality as well as the assessment of personality. Several years after they both earned their PhDs in 1976, they met in Maryland at the National Institutes of Health. They both started working there and realized they had similar interests. Together, they developed the five-factor model of personality and identified the popular Big Five, the OCEAN acronym that many of you are familiar with. When they initially identified these five factors, 
they went out of their way to confirm whether those five factors were the five factors. They wanted to make sure there weren't four factors or six factors. They confirmed the presence of these five factors through self ratings, objective personality tests, and also ratings from others, from an individual's therapist, for example. Using their data and their model, they developed the NEO personality inventory. The NEO PI, just like the 16 PF, is still used today to assess personality. Here are the five factors of their theory. I remember them using the OCEAN acronym, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. People who score high on the neuroticism scale tend to be insecure and worried. People who score high on the extroversion scale tend to be talkative, fun-loving, and affectionate. People who score high on the openness dimension tend to be creative thinkers and independent, able to come up with original solutions to problems. People who score high on the agreeableness scale tend to be good-natured, trusting of others, and courteous in social situations. Those who score high on the conscientiousness scale tend to be hard workers, reliable, and organized. If you'd like to take an adapted version of the NEO, please go to this website. You can see here that Costa and McRae created a model, a illustration of the different factors that impact our behavior in any given situation. On the left in the rectangle, you can see the big five factors. These are the behaviors that we tend to use across situations. Right above the rectangle, you can see biological bases. McRae and Costa agreed that genetics, DNA, plays a role in the basic tendencies we each exhibit. On the right side of the figure, you see in the oval, they've included a reference to the environment, to the social factors that influence personality. Modern research has found quite a bit of support for Costa and McRae's early ideas about personality. Neuroticism, extroversion, openness, and conscientiousness all show a strong genetic component. Agreeableness shows a stronger environmental component. All five factors have been found in a variety of different cultures. This model is not just for middle-class Americans. This model applies to humans across nations, across cultures. Research does support the idea that these factors, these traits remain stable across time. There are some gender differences when it comes to these personality traits. Women tend to have higher levels of neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness than men. Something interesting that happens is that we tend to see other people as more conscientious and less neurotic than ourselves. We tend to see the good in other people and the bad in ourselves when it comes to the Big Five personality model. Modern researchers have examined the relationships between personality traits and both emotional and behavioral outcomes. We can see here that people who score high on emotional well being tests also score high on the conscientiousness, extroversion and agreeableness dimensions, as well as low on neuroticism. People who are highly extroverted tend to have a great deal of social support. They tend to be very likable and they tend to experience and express positive emotions. People who are highly neurotic tend to experience and express more negative emotions. In terms of the behaviors that we might expect, individuals who are highly conscientious 
tend to get better grades in school, tend to perform better at work, and tend to enjoy better health outcomes, including lower rates of drug alcohol abuse. Individuals who are highly agreeable also tend to get better grades in school and report few behavior problems. People who score high on the openness dimension tend to have a wide range of interests and they deliberately seek out challenges from their environment. People who are highly extroverted tend to have more social relationships. This simple table summarizes the research regarding personality traits and use of social media. Individuals who are highly conscientious have more Facebook friends and they shop online because it's convenient. People who are not conscientious use Facebook because they're lonely. Highly neurotic individuals tend to post more photos, tend to be addicted to video games more so than those who are emotionally stable. Neurotic individuals shop online to avoid people in the brick and mortar stores. Extroverts use social media almost to the point where it's a compulsion where they are going to the social media platform anytime they feel lonely. They also tend to have more Facebook friends. People who score low on the agreeableness scale are more likely to send suggestive photos to other people. People who score high on the openness dimension tend to shop online because it's fun, because it's a new adventure, they like to see what they can find. Those who score low on the openness dimension spend less time using computers and less time playing video games. The Big Five model has enjoyed considerable replication. There have been many studies looking at these dimensions and their relationship with a variety of outcomes. These five factors are common to virtually all urban cultures. The model also has high predictive value in a variety of situations. Not only can we predict emotions and behaviors in private life, but we can also predict emotions, attitudes, behaviors in the workplace using the Big Five model. The final trait approach I'd like to cover in this lecture is one that was developed by Delroy Paul Huss and Kevin Williams. It's called the dark triad of personality. This is the one personality theory that we'll cover in class that focuses more on the negative traits of personality. Paul Huss earned his PhD from Columbia University in 1980. He is currently working for the University of British Columbia in Canada. Kevin Williams is currently with the Educational Testing Service, the people who create the GRE. In 2002, they published their model of the dark side of personality. They called it the dark triad because it included three dimensions, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathology. Narcissistic individuals tend to be extremely selfish. They tend to have an over-exaggerated perception of their abilities, their skills, their talents, and they have a constant need for attention and admiration. Those who score high on the Machiavellianism dimension tend to manipulate others. They have a desire for power. They want to influence other people and they will do just about anything to make that happen. They tend to use deceitful, cunning behaviors to get what they want. People who score high on the psychopathology dimension are insensitive to other people's needs and emotions. They are egocentric, thinking that their own way of being is really the best way of being, the only way of being. They tend to be antisocial. They take advantage of other people. They use charm, manipulation, and sometimes even violence to get what they want. 
nearly 10 years after Paul Huss and Williams published the dark triad model, Paul Huss worked with another individual, Jones, to create the short dark triad, a 27 item self-report inventory designed to measure these three traits, these three dark side personality traits. If you'd like to take an adapted version of this test, you can visit this website. If this test says that you are narcissistic, take it with a grain of salt. We would never use a single 27 item test to determine that you are truly narcissistic and need help. One year later, two different researchers, Jonathan and Webster, published The Dirty Dozen, a 12 item self-report inventory also designed to measure the dark triad. Instead of 27 items, this test includes 12 items. I have a table from their article I wanted to show you. It's another example of factor analysis. The first four items of the dirty dozen are said to load onto the Machiavellianism dimension. The second group of four items load onto the psychopathology dimension. The last four items then load onto the narcissism scale. Each of the three dimensions is measured using four items. Four times three is 12, hence the dirty dozen. We've identified some of the behaviors that are associated with the dark triad dimensions. For instance, people who score high on all three dimensions tend to be involved in antisocial activities. They tend to enjoy the suffering of other people and they are not afraid to promote themselves in social situations. People who score high on the psychopathology dimension also tend to have high sex drives and possess fantasies of a sexual and sadomasochistic nature. In this lecture, we covered four different trait approaches to personality. Next week, we will turn our attention to the humanistic approaches to personality.